All right, people, we are live, and this is a moment you've all been waiting for. Finally, we've got a superstar scientist and an atheist with us, and Lawrence Krauss. Uh, by the way, how, how, how should I address you? Professor Lawrence, Professor Krauss? I don't care. Lawrence is fine, okay. whatever you're comfortable okay. with. Yeah. Um, okay, Lawrence, thank you very much for being a part of the show. Um, well, let's get straight into it, because we've only got an hour, and I wanted to ask you, nine years ago, you had this debate with um, uh, with then famous Muslim apologist, uh, gorgeous George, by, or Hamza Sorsi, you might remember him as. Yeah. Um, that 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 was a turning event in this in the Muslim world, and I'm and I can understand probably you might not be uh, up to date with what's been happening in the Muslim world, how atheism is uh, is growing almost mm -hmm. at the same pace as it did in the first part of the last decade or after 2005 in the Western world. Um, oh, I didn't know that. that. No, no, yeah, it, it, you, you'd be surprised to see. Uh, all the indicators is like Iran is close to 40%, which is just as much as the United States. Wow, that's amazing. Um, Sorry. It's, it's, uh, yeah, now you look great. So at that time, you were asking about... Uh, a lot of Muslims became aware of this atheism versus Islam because every religion holds its own ideas that, okay, our religion is the mm -hmm. best one. Yes, Lawrence and Dawkins and Sam Harris, these guys are targeting um, uh, Christianity because Christianity is flawed already. We know that. But now, hang on. Now they became aware of this. And the new atheist movement is actually spreading to that and the next generation of activists like ourselves. Uh, you know, our videos have been watched over 50 million times in India and Pakistan. So oh. how do you see this? that how that this rising tide of atheism could you have perceived that because i remember professor dawkins saying that he wasn't really confident with the muslim world but he was hopeful with the western world well first of all it's a surprise and i guess a pleasant surprise i guess it's not it's not i guess it's not as surprising to me as it as it might be to richard I, the point is that um the the major difference between the muslim world and the, and the christian world and it comes, in my, I've always thought from the fact that, that Islam is 600 years younger than Christianity or so, is that um, no one takes the Bible, well, almost no one takes the Bible literally, or the admonitions in the Bible literally. The people who call themselves Christians don't stone their children because they're disobeying them or, or those sort of things. That passed hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And they like to pick and choose from the Bible to the things they like, and they call themselves Christians or Jews or whatever based on you know they don't they, they don't they just take what they like now what always amazed me about the at least the islamic world of, of islamic fundamentalists that i've been interacting with like times of sources is that they the quran is taken in the way the bible used to be taken uh 500 years ago as the absolute truth every word of it uh the requiring uh adherence etc and that in the modern world, uh, I think it's real. It's much harder to maintain that kind of um, that kind of fervent uh, fundamentalist belief in things. Which you know, when you ultimately, when you look at it, you realize some of these things are clearly not not right, and therefore you have to pick and choose. So I, I guess the uh, I would suspect the rise of atheism is in direct response to the to the to the far greater fundamentalism in Islam than in Christianity that that has provoked a response and you know it's like a, it's like a long tail right you, you, you there's a low hanging fruit and all those people are going to respond and then it'll take a lot longer or who knows if it'll ever go all the way for the rest of the people to recognize the sort of um uh, I was going to say silliness but the but the inaccuracies of of their sacred books and, and so, you know, that's what's happened in Christianity. You see it go off, and then there's a slow decline. Um, and it's a slow decline because most people, many people are comfortable calling themselves Christians who are essentially, in all other senses, atheists, who basically don't take much of their sacred books as, re as, as, as literally or real. And, um, you know, and I th so as I say, I, I'm not too surprised, I guess, that it's falling off quickly um, in response to that fundamentalism. And unfortunately... The other aspect of Islamic fundamentalism has been violence and terror, and and I think people um, people respond to that by saying, "Well, it, that you know that religion must be quote unquote bad." Now, the 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 Muslims who are 
not into that. I'm sure, I, you know, often feel hard done by because people identify Islam with Islamic fundamentalism and think of it as a, a you know, think of it as pure evil. And, um, and that's unfortunate for those people who, 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 who practice their religion in a peaceful way that doesn't impact others. I, you know, I, I still think it's the basis of it is, is it has no basis, but I, I don't mind what people think as long as it doesn't negatively impact on what they do. And um, anyway, so the fact that it's got a bad rap in, in the Western world, I, I think probably has, has a, had a, a, a uh, overflow into the, into the Islamic world where people look and say, in a minute, if if this provokes this kind of violence and terror, there must be something wrong with it. That's a long answer to a short question. No, that was a very, very good answer, and and it's obviously since Richard Dawkins and the so-called New Atheism movement started up, and then the reason why it was, so, even though the ideas, the arguments, but Russell and even before that, Hume and Kant and all these guys, that, that's been going on for nearly two, three hundred years in the Western world, it didn't really happen in the Muslim world. But the reason how Obviously, there are various factors that might have contributed to that, and one of them being um, social media itself. But the new atheist movement was so successful in the West that it was bound to have this impact in the in the in the Muslim world as well. Um, by the way, the, the, we just had a census in Australia uh, last year, but the results just came out, and uh, you, you'll be surprised. Well, you shouldn't be surprised, as you said, in the case of Muslim world. But within five years, in 2016, we were 30 percent agnostics and atheists or no religion, but now it's jumped to 40% in Australia. Well, I like to well. think I played a role. I used to you do, did. I used to do ABC all the time and talk. Of, anyway. Yeah. Just... <laughs> yeah, no, you did. You did. Um, and, and what what it did, and that leads me to my next question, because New Atheist Movement, and especially you, and then you debated with a lot of people, and you were given a lot of hard time by a lot of um, by, by, by a lot of Muslim apologists at that time. And if I look at that nine-year-old video, there, were, there was discussion or, or points that you made up uh, you, you brought up were blasphemy and homophobia, etc. in Islam, but but you didn't even bring up apostasy, for example, because I guess at that time it was it was ex-Muslim movement was still in its infancy, and yeah. not a lot of people know about this floodgates opening up. Um, but you, at that time, you Professor uh, Dawkins and um, uh, Sam Harris and all the new, and, and obviously before mm -hmm. that Christopher Hitchens, you guys never shied away from taking on Islam. Because you know, oh, it's a foreign religion, it's a brown man's religion, it's not my problem. So I'm not going to talk about it. I'm going to talk about the evils of Christianity in the far right. But, but, and, and that had its impact on us, people like us who were listening to you, watching you, and uh, reading your books. By the way, we did your um, um, Universe from Nothing book in an eight part series in Urdu, and we, we've been explaining well, it to, um, yeah, yeah, so uh, yeah, 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 people, people love it. Um, but now it seems like the even professor dawkins he stepped away from it like nobody really talks about islam i get it that the new generation has come forward like people like us who know islam inside out and we criticize it but I, I, it just forces me to wonder is that because this wokeism this cancel culture has even had an impact on some influencers and educators like you as well that maybe we shouldn't touch it well i think the cancel culture has had an impact in the sense that in a different way, uh, I think, the, first of all, we didn't shy away from criticizing Islam just because I think for most of us, it was not qualitatively different in the sense of, uh, you know, it, it, it was a religion like the others. And, and uh, you know, it had obviously in the modern world, it had a closer connection generally, but not always to violence. But but I so I think it was just a matter of it was just another religion and, and one shouldn't steer away from it. I think that I think what's happened, the re reason that many of people you maybe steer away is unfortunately the atheist movement. It's kind of like, I don't know if you, if you saw the movie um, life of Brian, which is my mind, one of the yeah you know, Python movie, probably yeah. the most accurate portrayal of what it was really like at the time of Jesus. Yeah. And, and, but if you remember there were these, it, there, it splintered into these movements. There's this wonderful scene where there's, they're in this Roman amphitheater and, you know, someone says I'm from the, Palestine Liberation Front. No, but we're from the Liberation Front for the we're from the front for the liberation of Palestine. And they start arguing and fighting. Yeah. And unfortunately, it looks, it seems, at least to me, um, that that's happened within the atheist movement. Uh, and and that that there is so much internal strife 
that for people like me, and I, I can't speak for Richard or others, that it, it just becomes, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it, it's not worth it to, to, to waste your time on that kind of, um, that kind of political nonsense. And also, frankly, it, again, it, you know, I, I've said what I've said and, and I've done, and I've written what I've written and you can, and, and, and at some point, you you know, you get tired of uh, being asked to, to talk about those same things. I'd much rather be personally, as I told Richard, and even at the time, I've, I've always said, I'd much rather excite people uh, with the realities of the real universe than criticize religion. I mean, it seems like just such a waste of time when you can instead try and get people to to, to be excited about reality. And that that's still, for me, my number one goal. But but does it, but but that's what was different about you guys. That a lot of scientists who actually don't believe in religion. Um, there was a Pew survey. I think it said only thirty three percent of uh, AAAS scientists believe yeah. in a god. So meaning the rest either don't believe in a god or you know like some vague deistic god or Spinoza's god or whatever. But that was different about you. That you said no. You know what we're going to come after the religion because uh, well yeah i think I, yeah i think most first of all most scientists most academics steer away from any controversy steer away from anything that they they try and keep their heads below the radar it's just a property of academics most are cowards and um and if they were if they were able to deal with the real world they probably wouldn't be academics for the most part um and yeah. and because once you open up it, it does expose you to a lot of things and um and I think I think it, it it comes down to this that some of us uh, had a public voice because of our science or our writing or something else, and the question is how to use that responsibly. So if you have a public voice, and that automatically removes most scientists, and there's a small set. And I know some people have had a public voice who say, "No, I don't want to alienate anyone." Um, and you know, I actually had I remember I had a discussion with Sam Harris early on, and I I, I sort of. Sam has just sort of gone off, and I'm kind of in my mind a kind of a one-trick pony. But, but um, the the uh, early on, Sam said something to me that that actually had an impact. I I was pointing out early on that, and I said, well, it, and it's still true, that science can't disprove the existence of God. So stop pretending that science can disprove the existence of God. Of course, it can't. Can't prove. I can't disprove the fa- the the claim that you and I were created five seconds ago. With the, the with with the memories of every of, of false memories of an entire life, how could I ever? How could, you can't disprove that kind of stuff. So I would point out that we should we should point out that science can't disprove the existence of God. But but that's fine. But that but it's it's disingenuous to to say that and not point out that the Bible and the sacred books are full of nonsense. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a discussion with Sam where, where I thought, you know, yeah, it's probably you can't just stop there. It's 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 I'm not sure it's hypocritical, but it's it's not consistent if you want to be honest about it to say there. You, yes, you can't disprove the existence of God, but you certainly can disprove a lot of the false claims that are made. In, and and once I realized that, um, I guess I became more vocal. But for me, it was also a matter of defending science. I got involved in it by trying to protect the teaching of evolution in biology classes in high schools. That's how I got that, you know, sort of that, that notoriety nationally is I, I was disappointed that none of the biologists were doing it. And it really wasn't an attack on biology. It was an attack on science anyway. And as a scientist with a fairly large public following, I, I, I felt it was my an obligation to do that, but that was, it. it was really more defensive maneuver and attacking sort of the fundamentalist beliefs. But then my own perspective evolved when we made that movie, uh, The Unbelievers, mm. uh, because the response to that movie amazed me. I realized it wasn't just the fundamentalists who were problematic here. It's all those people who have questions, like everyone has questions, but they don't they don't know that they're allowed to ask those questions. They feel like bad people for asking those questions. They live in small towns in, say, the United States. And they, they not only is there no one they can ask those questions to, but they're even afraid to admit they have the questions because people they sure the people around them will view them as bad people for asking those questions. And um, and they have no one to turn to. And then they see a movie like that and they say, hey, I'm not alone. Uh, it's OK to question. 
And for me, that was the most important impact. I realized it's not just the fundamentalism. It's the sense, it's the hijacking of morality that religion has that stops people from asking questions. And as an educator and a scientist, stopping people from asking questions is, is the worst thing you can do. Uh, it, it, it shuts out thinking and it shuts out progress and it shuts out life. Yeah, but you, you said that um, then you thought, you know, it's just not worth it you know, because it comes with all the other stuff, when, especially if you make a discovery about the Big Bang or whatever, some cosmological event, which is far bigger than any of us. But that wouldn't draw any, uh, uh, you know, any, any blowback. But um, but having said that, though, what you or what you guys initially did from 2004, four five onwards uh, up until 2012, 13, that has caused a revolution. Like, as I said, you would well, not have imagined. It's, you know, it's had an impact. It's, you know, you never know. And it's, it's and it's, sometimes you worry that you're preaching to the converted. And um, again, that's one of the reasons we made the movie, I think, to try and reach a broader audience. Than, than, and, and, and it's great that it's had an impact. And as I say, it's not, I remember when we were in Sydney at the Opera House. I think it was mm -hmm. at the Opera House, which I've, yeah. done, I've now done twice, I think, or three times. I'm honored to have sat on the stage nobody yeah. lets me in yeah <laughs> well i'm honored that that i that i did on that stage a bunch of times but anyway i think someone says how, someone asked maybe uh, anyway somewhere in australia how can you you know how can you convince people to 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 join your movement or to list follow you or something like that and and richard answered and i, I echoed it we don't, we don't want people to follow us we just want people to think and ask questions and that's the difference there's no one, you know, and I don't even like talking about a movement. People, I'm not a part of any movement. I'm just a, you know, I'm just a, a scientist and a person who tries to encourage people to think, ask questions and open their minds. So I guess I don't, I, that old Groucho Marx line, I really don't like to be a member of any club that would have me as a member. And um, <laughs> uh, I, I uh, so I think that it's great that there's been an impact, but, but I don't like the idea of, of you know, having it turned into a, a movement because that automatically becomes like a secular religious movement. And I see it happen in the United States in the atheist movement. There's this woke attitude and it, it's, it's basically secular religion. There's, Oh, there's certain things you can't that, that are accepted as universal truths and you can't debate them. You can't question them, whether it has to do with racism, sexism or something else. And, and any discussion gets you excommunicated. And so it's just like a secular religion. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you just briefly touched the fact on your conversation with Sam Harris and you said um, you, you can't disprove God. And yes, we've always known that. But but as you rightly pointed out, that hang on a second, people are not necessarily interested in the God question. What they're interested in proving that their God and their religion with the whole set of baggages that it comes with, that's the correct one. So I, so we, all, and this is the reason why we're, we're just referred to 33% of AAA scientists believe in a God, but then there's a big 20% or something that believe in something that they can't explain. So that's irrelevant. I call it the God of irrelevant. That That's just totally irrelevant. If he doesn't know, if he hasn't spoken to me, to me, he's just as relevant as some alien species. So people yeah, are interested in People, that, people yeah. need something to believe in. And, and also when people point out that, I think in the case of the National Academy of Sciences, like something like 95% believe well, but the, the real surprising question is that 5% do and, and, and uh, you know, do believe in it. But, you know, when you're taught things as a child, it's really hard to get rid of them. Uh, but you're right. People people want their – and I, I think that's how you can reach people is pointing out, you know, I wasn't the first person to say it, and, and Richard wasn't, I'm sure. But, you know, that all – that religious people are just like atheists. It's just one less religion they don't believe yeah. in. And and try to think of ways to get people to question their own situation. As a, as a teacher, that's what I try and do – have tried to do anyway. It's the only way people learn. And And – I had an awakening with Richard, and I've talked about it. When, when I forget if I, how well I knew Richard then, but I certainly heard him lecture, and he showed a picture of uh, of you've heard me probably talk about this of four uh, kids at Christmas time in a newspaper. And yeah, there's, there's three or four year old kids, and they say, "Here's a here's a Christian kid, here's a Hindu kid, here's a Muslim kid, here's a Jewish kid." Yeah, and then the point is, how dare we label three year olds that way? And then, wow, I, I thought. You know, I never realized, I never thought about that. So that's the kind of thing where you can sort of wake people up to ask questions about the things we're complacent about that we shouldn't be complacent about. 
Yeah, uh, yeah, Professor Dawkins. I think he was probably he was the first one. I think. Well, I, at least I heard this argument for the first time in the God Delusion as well. He discussed that, and he he, he called it. It's akin to uh, child abuse. And the oh, more I speak with, yeah, yeah. Well, well, yeah, it's, it's a common logical answer. We, but... we said in, I remember we said in Ireland that caused a big uproar when we were together in Ireland. We said it with religion was child abuse. But anyway, sir, go on. Yeah, the the um, okay, just moving on. Uh, because this thing now what you guys experienced in the west mm -hmm. nearly what nearly 15 years ago now this sudden uh you know this this non-apologetic way of questioning religions we're doing that in india and pakistan and a lot of people are drawn to it and you know like and our case is slightly a bit different like you know like i'm a hunted man because <laughs> i'm an oh, really? oh, i mean that's the point I, I let me point that out people say i'm sorry to keep interrupting people know i interrupt but um um, okay. uh, you know, somehow people say we're somehow brave, Richard and I, and I say, you know, no, look at the people and, you know, the, the, whose lives are at, at risk in, in, in Pakistan, maybe India, but other places, you know, I get letters from people all the time who have to keep their views quiet from Afghanistan or, or you, you pick the country. And, um, and, and that's the kind of, you know, those people are, are brave and, and those people are, it's a much bigger threat than just having people write angry letters <laughs> that's mm. no, there's no, you know, or even attempt to cancel us. I mean, that's not a, that's nothing compared to what people in, in Pakistan or other places are dealing with who are trying to educate people. But having said that, though, I, I would I would also take the liberty to say I don't think I'm brave because I'm living in sometimes in Europe, sometimes in, in Australia. So I'm privileged that I'm not in Pakistan. But I certainly know people, activists from within Pakistan who've been killed and people who are seeking asylum. And they, they've been waiting for five years to be to resettle to America or Canada, or United Kingdom. So those people are actually brave and they have yeah, a lot of my yeah, respect yeah. as well. And I know I get letters um, from people who try to help them. But anyway, CFI is probably the only organization that's actually helping a lot. Uh, there, there's no secular movement for atheists. And and, I, and I've felt it because I, I thought the America, the international, what's it called? Atheist uh, Alliance. International Atheist Alliance. Alliance yeah. Yeah. yeah they, they, they were doing some things. But anyway. Yeah, and then the there's, CFIs, uh, yeah, yeah, there's sorry. Kid, be, uh, borders beyond yeah. belief about whatever it's called. There's that group. Yeah, yeah, anyway. uh, yeah. They, they they they're very limited. They mm -hmm. don't um, actually help out asylum seekers. Like for for example, what happens with these people? First of all, they have to get out of their home country, and then they yeah. go to these other countries mm -hmm. and they stay there. And they, they go to UNHCR and they apply for um, yeah. uh, asylum, and then. That process can take up to four, five, six years for them to be resettled into these uh, Western countries. So in that meantime, who's going to look after them? So, um, so, so, so CFI, to the best of my knowledge, is the only one that actually gives them some allowance, um, and, and and you know they can live there uh, with, with dignity. So well, that's um, nice to know CFI does something useful. I don't see them doing much useful in the states, but but it's nice to know they're doing something useful elsewhere. No, that, yeah, we, 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 I have enormous respect for them. Um, well, that's I, great. I wanted to, I, I wanted mm -hmm. to ask you um, the because this movement is in its infancy, so we are trying to replicate what happened in uh, okay. post nine eleven, uh, and we're doing the same questions, like very simple questions like that, like something you said, like everyone is an atheist, you know, we just go one god further, um, god of irrelevance. And also the moral problems within Islam are so bad that majority of Muslims had never heard of them. Like, I mean, I'm sure if I showed you some of the sayings of the Prophet, you'd be shocked beyond belief. Yeah, you well, yeah, I'm often shocked. People show me these things as I learn. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can understand that. Um, so, 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 but people become obviously defensive, but I've had over thousands, I've had thousands of letters and videos people call me in, in, in my show and, and, and you know, they, they, they change their mind. So there, there's always hope. But now people like me, I'm, I'm probably, I'm saying it with all humility, I'm, I'm probably the biggest Pakistani atheist uh, who, who does a show in Urdu. So from my, a lot of people have heard. So biggest clerics in, in Pakistan and even in the Muslim world, the world has changed a lot since your Hamza Zorsi's interview. Every um, scholar worth his salt has said atheism is rising in our community. What do we do? And they're trying to reinterpret. They're trying everything. They're just clutching at straws to to do something. But they, with us, because they can't reach out to you, they say, well, Western atheists are better people. They are very academic in their approach. They don't target religions. Um, and because we're, we come from Islamic background and in Pakistan and India, we're obviously in, 
yeah. Islam and Hinduism we're going to talk about. So it seems very confronting to them. And I always say, no, have you not heard of Lawrence Krauss? Have you not heard of Richard Dawkins? And obviously they haven't. Um, so, so why do you call yourself an atheist? And why is it important to actually go after religions? I know you don't do that anymore, but why is it important? Well, I think it's important for the re sort of the reason that you just pointed out that people need examples, and and if they if if they if they don't see that people either like themselves or people that they look up to for other reasons are willing to say they're atheists, then 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 how can you expect that? How can you expect them to be willing to even recognize that they are? So I think it's important. Um, and it's important to speak the truth. I mean, I, I have, I know, I have a colleague of mine who's a Nobel Prize winning scientist who I have great respect for as scientists. Zero respect for, because he constantly says, no, I don't want to, I don't want to rock the boat. I don't want to, um, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't think it's good to, you know, there's all these rationales that people give for not, you know, for not speaking out. And they accept, I say, but, you know, I understand you don't want to antagonize people. That's fine, but you agree that the, that that these ridiculous claim, fundamentalist claims, are just wrong and demonstrably wrong, empirically wrong. Yes. Then why don't you why don't you say that? And why don't you point out that if some of the if some of the claims of their of the scriptural of the scriptures are wrong, then it then then it's possible that the whole thing is, or, or you can't that that it's not. Um, whatever the word that the, 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 the Pope is infallible, it's not infallible. And if it's not infallible, then you can start asking questions about everything. Um, so I, anyway, I think it's important that some, just like I think it's important that some scientists speak out about science and about science policy, not every scientist. Um, but I, I think people need, sometimes need role models. They also need to realize that people um, are not afraid to say uh, something that for some people is sacrilegious. The mm. claim that you don't, you know, you don't find God, God com the idea of God compelling should not be something that brings re a reign of terror upon you, death and destruction, or even shock, as it does in many places, because people are afraid to say it. And as long as people are afraid to say what they're thinking, and most people, and let's face it, many people who call themselves Christian in the Western world, are atheists, but they're certainly, they'll never say it because, in fact, you know the, uh, and I've talked about this, but you know the survey that was done by Richard's Foundation in England. Yeah. Where, ask, where you know, they asked Christians, do you believe in this, 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 and this, all the things in the Bible? They said, no. Why do you call yourselves a Christian? And um, and they said, well, I like to think of myself as a good person. And that's, once again, the, the uh, fact that religion has usurped morality. And these were the people who couldn't even tell whether Genesis was the first book or not. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know exactly. I mean, most people, I imagine most people who are Christian have done very little reading of the, the Bible. I read a lot more of the Bible. I looked at the Koran when I was younger, too. But I read, I learned a lot more about the Bible, Old and New Testaments, once I started um, sort of speaking out about religion, because my colleagues like Richard and particularly Christopher Hitchens, were able to give me, you know, lots of examples of, of things mm. that I hadn't realized how ridiculous were, were in there. You said um, you read a little bit of the Quran when you were younger. So are you telling me you didn't find anything that turned no, your heart? That lifted... Well, no, I read I read a lot. I just read a lot of things when I was younger and I thought I should at least look at it. Um, I think when I know when I was young, I wanted to believe in stuff. Um mm. At the time, you know, I thought of, but I was, I grew up in Canada. I guess I, I, it was quaint. I just thought of it as kind of an interesting, maybe it was an interesting bit of literature that I didn't think people, I really didn't think people took it seriously. So I guess I, I figured it an ancient book that I should look at, just like I looked at ancient books of Greece and, and Rome, you know, to understand the culture around me. And so I guess I never thought of it as something, I never even thought of it as something I should I should even believe it. Ought to, I mean, it just was clear to me that it would, you know, some people talk about the wisdom of the ancients, but the ancients didn't have a lot of wisdom. Well, it's funny that you say that because the huge part in India, uh, a lot of my audience is in India as well. And they have, they also have this obsession that you might've seen it in the news somewhere, Hindu nationalism rising and far right. And, you know, like it, it, yeah. India sitting on a powder cake, but they have this obsession, and it, it seems like there's 
that there's a lot of funding coming from the state level, but anyway, without going into a conspiracy part, there was uh, actually there was a news story written by New York Times that said that um, the they had this obsession that our ancestors knew everything. They knew how to fly yeah. planes. They discovered MRI machines and all that. Uh, why do you think there's such a obsession? And I look at every every culture that that is. Well, that I think is, I think advances, again, I, I think it's it's we we want to believe. I, I just think it comes down to that. And ancient cultures are exotic. And I think, um, and because religious belief harkens back to those ancient cultures and people are taught early on that, you know, these sacred books were given back then, it's natural to assume that somehow back then people had access to more, to more, to some, to some yeah. um, realities that we don't today. And, yeah. um, and, uh, um, and and so it, it's you know I think it's and 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 writers you know it's they it's easy to play off that there was what chariot of the gods it was called, um, and uh, um, uh, the you know that said I think it was aliens came down and you know get, get, gave Built the wisdom the and so yeah. I think it's ancient it's aliens easy to play off people's hopes and desires and charlatans do just that and do it well. How do you how do you look at this um, Sam Harris's argument about psychedelics? And because Sam Harris said it, that's why I always wa was intrigued about it. But if anyone else had said it, I probably wouldn't have cared because I, my mom told me to stay away from drugs, and I always did. But he says that we assume that all these guys were charlatans, these prophets, and they were just you know they were they were very clever, conniving, cunning people who took advantage and make most out of their gift of gab or the yeah. ha, ha, but if you've tried you know dmt or something then you would see you would think that there might be something more to it they, they're genuinely having some vision i get it albeit that would still be crazy it might not have anything to do with reality but how do you how do you see it? do you think that they were these were charlatans or they they were just you know seeing things uh, look i don't understand sam's fascination with buddhism and drugs are two things <laughs> I, I don't understand, and he seems to somehow, like many things, he seems to think that unless you've had his experiences, you somehow can't see understand the world, and it's just garbage. It's not true. And you don't need to take drugs. To, you don't need to even, as far as I'm concerned, you don't need to meditate. It's not as if these are unique ways of of exploring yourself and the world around you. They've helped him, and that's fine. I'm fine with that. But, you know, his, his notion that somehow... It, it, psychedelics reveal something i mean you know they, they, don't reveal they're, anything. they're 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 a novel human experience and and for people mm. who want to have novel human experiences every experience you have um informs you in some way so i'm not suggesting that people can't get informed or or have new realizations by taking psychedelics the thing that i question and the thing that i i, I think is nonsense is the claim that that's the only way to reach enlightenment and, and that not that's nonsense yeah that, that that would be very difficult to assert that you know you could only come with that but i think your late friend christopher hitchens said uh, in his one of his last interviews with the abc or something it was uh, where he said that uh, i i'm angry that i'm dying so soon my father drank and smoked but uh, but when i look back i don't regret it because had I not drunk or had I not been smoking, I would not have written what I've written. I'm just paraphrasing it, obviously. So, so yeah. could there be something that you know, like some of these experiences? You said that, oh, yeah, we can't say if Shakespeare was drunk when he was writing all this great work, but could it be something? Some people to rely on. I mean, everyone has a drug of choice, and everyone ha rely we all rely on things that help us get through the day. And so, mm -hmm. I, you know, that's fine. I mean, some people need to drink, some people need to smoke, some people need to not drink. Some people need to, you know, it's we're, we're all individuals. And so if it floats your boat, as long as it doesn't hurt other people, I don't really care about it. And so I suspect, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I know, you know, having been a friend of Christopher's, I, I, I yeah, he, he couldn't have done what he did without smoking and drinking. I don't know if that was related to the reason he got his, his cancer. Yeah. But, but um, I think we, I think it's a mistake to regret well, it's a restrict mistake to regret lots of things, but but um, uh, 
if you think something is harmful to, for you, then then you should stop it, and 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 um, and harmful for the people around you, uh, in particular. You know, obviously, alcoholics hurt their families in in ways that are, that that are that are reprehensible or, or unfortunate. Um, but in any case, so yeah, I think I think if people if people in order to be productive and happy and good for others they need some personal crutch, then that's, then, you know, then who am I to argue against it? All right, fair enough. Um, you did say that you read the Quran, so I'm just going to put something in front of you because there was an obsession. Oh, by the way, congratulations. After your debate with Lawrence, uh, with uh, Hamza Sources, he actually changed his worldview. He actually made a, um, he said that we should not say that Quran has scientific miracles in there. But you remember when you actually, I'm sorry, um, you, you told him, hey, you don't know anything about science. You were so, and that was yeah, good. Yeah. That gave us some, a lot of, and, and that's true. Before you, a month or two months before you, he, he had a debate with a Pakistani professor, physicist, Pervez Hoodboy. I don't know if you've heard of him, but you should. Yeah. Um, you, you should bring him to an Origins podcast sometime. Um, I think it's Cheetahs of Berkeley or something. Um, yeah. He, um, yeah, so... He changed his views, so thanks to you. Because with, with Pervez Hoodboy, Pervez Hoodboy, he was saying that there's M theory in the Quran, and Professor mm -hmm. said, "Well, you don't know anything about M theory. Come, come, come up on the blackboard and draw the equation of M theory." And yeah. he was like, "Oh, I don't know." Um, so, so he dropped that idea. But there's still a lot of people. I don't know if you ever heard of this Muslim apologist, Dr. Zakin Naik. Um, people people really send be... me names and videos. Usually, I ignore them. Yeah. He, he, he speaks like the brother has a very good vision. <laughs> that, yeah. that guy, maybe. Okay. So anyway, so he popularized this idea that there is the Big Bang in the Quran, the, the earth goes around the sun, and the, the, nothing. So I'm, I'm just going to show you some verses. You, now, obviously, you're a scientist. Now, people like me, when I bring it up, they say, well, Horace, you're not a scientist. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring up something in front of you, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you maybe, am I missing something? For you as a scientist, if uh, if the creator of the universe was trying to give us something, was that a good way of conveying message? So this is Quran chapter 11, verse 7. It says, and he it is who created the heavens and the earth in six days, and his throne was upon the water. So Muslims try to reinterpret it and say, well, his throne was above the water. So when there was, uh, before the Big Bang, there was water, and above that there was a throne, and God was sitting on it. Um, can, could, could, can, is there any way you can interpret it which is in sync with the reality that no, we know? No, and in fact, you know, I wrote a book, my very first book uh, about dark matter, explored the um, the notion, these notions, and in fact, this notion that water was the primordial substance is certainly goes, you know, my, uh, the thing that people have to realize is that every religion steals from the religions before it, and yeah. and identical, you know, this Jesus story happens so many times in so many other religions. There's nothing special about it. And similarly, water was a central part in the Rig Veda. It, 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 if you go back thousands of years, you'll find some other notion that 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 the that the planet em emerged out of water, and, mm. and it, it even occurs in the Bible. And 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 um, the, of course, the, the remarkable thing is, if 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 you create the heavens and the earth, where was the water? And you, you know, and, and, and you haven't yet created water. Um, so, so the point the point is that it's it's allegorical, but it's also a direct theft of the idea that's that's thousands of years older than Islam. But um, so, the, but anyway, so if the notion that that I mean, let's make it quite clear: at the early history of the universe, there was no water, there were no yes, atoms, huh? there was no there were no structures, and um, and uh but this is an old old religious idea not a scientific one that that islam is clearly adopted by the way it's a quran is very repetitive as well so i don't know how you could actually keep focusing on it so the same thing is written in another verse so ignore that um the, 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 there there was one more thing he's the one who has created everything that is on earth for you then he turned to heaven and per perfected it as seven heavens so basically, Earth was created before the heavens, and if by heavens you mean the sky. My, so. dog, my dog doesn't like it, as you can see. My dog, my dog. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you know, I mean, of course. What does that mean? It means nothing. But you know what? I get all these people who who send me these who, these quotes that are often so vague, and they say, "Oh, you know, uh, it says the Earth was. You know, it says that the, have, the universe was created. Well, that's the Big Bang. They clearly knew this." 
And it's like yeah. it's so vague; it could explain anything. It could it could relate to anything. It doesn't it doesn't explain anything. However, unlike science, which tells you what the implications of the Big Bang are, this is just some vague claim. Anyway, sorry, go on. But not only just that. I mean, yeah, this is this is an infamous chronic. Uh, sorry, Big Bang verse. Have not those who disbelieve seen how heaven and earth were one solid mass mass which we ripped apart. So obviously there was no earth at the moment of uh, Big Bang. And who are these disbelievers who did not see this? Like uh, this obviously refers to what was already happening in the- uh, Well, there was what, a skull mass. We're talking about the fact that, 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 the earth, uh, that the earth was bombarded by a Mars-sized object which tore out the moon. That's fine, yeah. but there was no life then for sure. And, um, and, uh, and, and in fact, nothing was solid in the early, it, 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 it's, there was no solidness that created the heaven and the earth. Okay, the solidness occurred later, not at the beginning. Right. My, my, my sorry. My point to bring that up was: it's amazing how uh, when we actually look at the text, they rely so heavily. They just you know six days means six billion years or something. Yeah. Try to reinterpret it. Try to reinforce it. But when when but when you talk to them about the deep meaningful questions like the God that we can't disprove, then they go into sophistry. Then they go like, oh, you know, what was there before the Big Bang? It must have been, well, hang on, whoever, whatever, whatever was there before the Big Bang, what is your God saying here? He's saying that he created the heavens and earth in six days and then his throne was above water. Yeah, just ask, just ask him where, where, in the, where in their sacred book does it explain the abundance of helium in the universe? Um, yeah. I, I mean, the point is that these vague claims are as old as people people invented as i say ancient myths there are thousands of religions they all have similar claims about some being raising the earth out of out of uh, out of water or creating this or that vaguely and none of them in any way explain anything just like you could say you know and then and then some people will claim the opposite you know it there you know if there was so if, if they knew so much how come they the, the bible doesn't have dinosaurs in it and and you know but yeah. Forget that. I mean, it, 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 it's just uh, um, uh, if you're sufficiently vague and your claims are sufficiently grand, there's no way you can disprove them. But the point is that they don't explain anything. They don't predict anything. They don't allow you to do anything you couldn't have done before. They don't give you any insight. They're just vague claims and they're not novel. They're not profound. They're not sacred because they've been around as long as people have been around and and as and and part of ancient religions and myths and beliefs and so there's nothing special about them yeah fair enough well, let's move on to the last question and um uh, by the way it's not always vague the equally respected just one step below quran and some people argue is, is some of these hadith books sahih bukhari for example is even higher than uh, the quran in some cases and i don't want to go into delve into that now Bukhari, the, the sayings of the Prophet are not really that uh, metaphorical or allegorical. This, this one, I love to tell the story. So the Prophet, you know, one day he was just going on his donkey with some other dude and he just said, hey, um, the Prophet said, uh, do you know where does uh, the, the, the sun go at, at nighttime? And he goes, oh, I don't know, Prophet, you would know. Um, and then he says, it, it goes under Allah's throne every evening and ask for the permission for Allah uh, to rise again from the east, and Allah grants him that permission. And one day, Allah is not going to give him the, um, uh, the 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 permission, and that would be the judgment day. So it's quite clear in this hadith that you know sun goes around the earth, and yeah, you, you yeah, always yeah, used yeah, to no, say that. And that's the point. And it's clear in the Bible too. It's a, that's what I always say. If this bo these books have great ancient wisdom, they didn't even know the earth went around the sun. Uh, and well, so the if they know the earth went on the sun, why are you assuming they know anything else? Yeah. There's sorry, one last peasants, you know, large, many of whom were illiterate anyway. Right. Sorry. One last question to you. One of our great, we call her the mother of our ex-Muslim movement. And I know it's, it's, it's not like a political movement, but we, we, people yeah, like us okay, are a bit sorry. activists. Don't worry about it. We, no, 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 no. That's fine. I mean, I, 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 as atheists, we actually don't like the labels. And we say that if, if the whole world was an atheist, the atheist term would become redundant. Um, uh, but, but anyway, so, but, but it does need a little bit of political passion and the desire to change. Sure. If you're an academic, you can rely on your thing, but we, we're trying to, so anyway, so you, you, you had a conversation with, um, Mariam Namazi and Mariam said something that she was upset with Noam Chomsky. And because I am communicating with Indians, Pakistani all the time, and there's a lot of anti-American sentiment, sentiment exists there. And they always quote 
people like Noam Chomsky because he's like he becomes their hero. Yeah. But you said um, so. So Mariam asked you. Mariam said, "I'm very disappointed, and I agree with uh, a non-American mil- uh, adventurism or military adventurism. I, I don't. I, I think there's a lot of truth in that too. But anyway, that's a different topic. But um, uh, but he never talks about the." Um, you know, uh, women's rights or apostates or blasphemy in, in these Muslim countries, and to which you said that well, he's only focusing on one thing. He not necessarily he's not ignoring the other, but it's just it's just an area of expertise, so to speak. But she still wasn't happy. Then you said that when you get a next opportunity, you'll actually bring that up and ask him about his views. So did that ever happen? Because that interview was about well, a year ago. Norman, I talk all the time, and I, and 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 his concerns about people's freedom are are uh, and 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 rights are. Are clear. Um, I, 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 all I can say is what I told her. In some sense, I think Noam's attitude is that other people can talk. You know, he can. T- he's going to focus on things that aren't brought up about the West that need to be said about the West that Westerners need to hear about their own countries, and that's where his interest is. And so, um, but you know, I will uh, next time I speak to Noam, I, I, I will push that a little little more i guess i'm sure i can't remember after i spoke to miriam whether i spoke specifically to noam about that subject we've brought it up i think i've brought it up um when we've had several discussions when he when he talks about one country or another and i say but yeah but but you know but the situation is worse here or there and i, I think he generally agrees and and so i uh, it, it, yeah i'm not going to be an apologist for noam and and i think um um, um, sh- she's absolutely right that it's really that, and, and you know, I think that's right now it's probably even more important because people people talk about it, it, especially this woke movement, and you know, the it, it focuses on on uh, on the crimes of the West and with and and without and ignores the crimes of of uh, of people of color. Or ancient other cultures, and and as somehow there that's fine, but somehow uh, the, the the West has to apologize for for everything it did, mm. but no, no other country. You know, uh, what's his name? Um, just wrote a book, The War on the West. Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray, yeah, yeah, and he makes that point very strongly. Yeah, but as an educator or as an influencer or uh, someone who has a platform, a large voice, and people like us are always tested, like, why are you always speaking against Islam? Then I say, okay, you know, I have the same opinion about Hinduism and Christianity as well. Yes, because I'm not very well versed on that. That's why I don't talk about it. But well, like, yeah, and, and, I think oh, and, and I think Noam Chomsky should make those kind of clear statements. He doesn't have to talk day and night about it. His areas of expertise is that. Well, I'll but talk at least about, so I'll people talk like us... About it. I'll talk right. to him about it. We talk regularly, and it's a good point. And I probably didn't bring it up enough after Miriam pointed out. And I hope, as you know, I have great respect for her and admiration for her. Great. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap this up, and we're going to just go through a couple of um, uh, super chats that we've received by George Orwell. Great to see your channel grow and your reach to some really amazing people. Welcome, Professor Kraus. Uh, Zach Ross is saying, Harris, brother, thank you for setting up this conversation with Professor Krauss. I know it will be super interesting and informative. Professor Krauss, see you and Professor Dawkins in Phoenix, Arizona on November 15th. Unbelievers for the win. This is you're coming back after a very long hiatus, I would say. Yeah, yeah we're going to be together in, in, in November in Arizona. I hope people, there's still lots of tickets left, and I hope we'll, uh, we'll and we're trying to give away might, a lot to students in particular. I might, okay, I might, I might, I might come to Arizona. Um, uh, or also, are you going to get John, other movie stars? Because you know, like you, you've spoken with Johnny Depp and I think Brad Pitt at one point, but Brad Pitt unfortunately fell off the rails a bit. I think he became Christian again. Anyway, but Johnny, Johnny was a good friend of mine, so oh, yeah, well, that's good. Well, um, uh, I mean, just saying, Professor Kraus, a big shout out from an ardent fan here. Learned so much from you over the years. Um, a bit of truth in Lawrence Krauss. So, can you please show us evolution evidence? Most of the times, believers re- keep refuting it and keep asking why apes remains apes. And there's a few people. Yeah, these are some very basic questions. I don't this know if you want to comment. The is, and the key question is: we the point is that we didn't evolve from apes. Apes yeah. and us co-evolved uh, from a common ancestor, and that's what's really important to realize. It's the biggest misunderstanding: um, is that we didn't evolve from apes. We and apes evolved from a common ape-like creature probably six million years ago. Yeah. Uh, fact checkers in Professor Krauss, you are one of my top uh, inspirations. I did watch all your interviews and debates. Love to see you with Harris. Okay, thank you very much. Fact checkers, that was a show. Love for Harris. And definitely check out the Origins podcast. You would see your 
all types of scientists and academics with Professor Krauss. And how is the podcast going? Uh, it's it's going well. It's a lot of fun. And as, as you know, I try to expand the full gamut of not just science and culture, but even political views. And, and um, we, this week we had, a, for those people who really want to hear the early history of the earth, we had, uh, we have uh, Andy Knoll from Harvard talking about the first 4 billion years in the history of the earth. And it's a fascinating discussion. Um, mm. I think next, in next week, we're going to have a discussion on exoplanets. Actually, oh. Richard Dawkins and I are ha 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 just, just recorded a long um, dialogue. And another thing that's very important for people, this person who, who talked about apes, um, I just recorded a, a, a podcast with uh, someone I like a lot named Franz de Waal, who's one of the world's foremost primatologists. Primatologists, talking, yeah. uh, talking about chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans. Anyway. All right. Um, yeah, by the way, yeah, Professor Dawkins was very kind. Like I, mean, I mentioned him in my book because he was the most inspirational figure in my life. Uh, but yeah, lucky you, you, you can call him a friend. I've been trying to get a hold of him for ages, but he, he, he did receive my book. And, you know, yeah. it, 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 it takes time, but you know, he yeah. gets, anyway, what yeah. can I say? Anyway. Okay. Come, because, come on our trip to Greenland and Iceland. Uh, uh, he won't be in Iceland, but come on our trip to Greenland. He'll be on that trip. Anyway. Gr Greenland? You, go, you guys going to Greenland? My foundation runs excursions where we try and explore places around the world that are relevant for things like climate change and we have a trip to Greenland in next month or a month and a half really? to, to mid-September. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, where, 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 what? where can people find more information about it? The Origins Project Foundation website, which lists our trips and our podcast and our other events. Okay, great. Originsproject.org. Greenland, yeah. I mean, I'm allergic to cold, but that's fine. I think we're, we're solving it. We're, we're, we're heating up the earth, so, you know, that wouldn't be a problem anymore. Well, <laughs> Greenland, is, I, the I point of reason I'm going to Greenland is I want to go there before it becomes green. Yeah, right. Um, Professor Krauss, please check, just check the trend of atheism in South Asia, created by Harris and then joined by Ghalib, is unbelievably spreading. We need some people like you and CFI to speak on the channels. Okay. Yes, so I wanted to ask you this question. Yeah, so fair enough. Um, the, the atheist, the new atheist movement has kind of spread and gone in other directions. And you're a scientist and an academic, and you've got so many other bigger and better and more interesting things to do. No, let me say, I, I almost never talk about atheism in the U.S. Uh, anyway, because I think it's a lost cause there. But 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 I I'm much more interested in going in when I do podcasts of talking to people in places like India or the, or Iraq or or Pakistan, Pakistan. or yeah. or South Asia. Because uh, that, I think, is you know, that's where it's important to have those discussions and where you normally can't. Yeah, yeah. Um, but having said that, a lot of ex-Muslims felt a bit neglected because the, the, after you guys, the huge army of influencers came out with YouTubers and they're the, the atheists, basically. But they're yeah. Western atheists and they have always stayed away from the ex-Muslim atheist community, because it's like, you know, again, it's the brown man's religion. It's just, you know, I don't want to get it. No, the ex-Muslims are the, are the as, I've, as I've said to Mariam and others, even in, I, don't, I think we had to take it out of the movie because of people's safety was concerned, but they're the ones I admire the most because they're the ones who are really risking so much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I'm going to have to uh, go in a minute. So. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, we've just done 53 minutes. Uh, can, can I just get one question from um, one of our uh, uh, the, the refugees, the asylum seeker that I was talking about, the people who have to leave the country. And he's the one who actually translated your book and, and explained it to, I think that video has been seen by nearly 300,000 people or something. Wow. Um, so he just might have a scientific question to you. Ghalib, just hi, hi. please, this, Professor has to go. This is, this is Ghalib. Let me just introduce myself briefly. I am, I am uh, from Pakistan. I am basically an atheist coming from the Christian background. So I'm oh, not right. an ex-Muslim, I'm an ex-Christian from Pakistan. In Pakistan, Christians are a very small minority, you know, persecuted minority. So my question, Dr. Cross, I'm really a big fan of you, your your books, you know, uh, the story of everything and the other one, the, uh, the universe, universe from nothing. nothing. You know, it, it, universe yeah. from nothing is actually one of my favorite books. And okay. Aris and I did some, uh, you know, videos on that as well. So my question is like, whenever we talk about the question of origin, it always comes down to, okay, the religious would always say that God created, God did the Big Bang. Because it, it, I think last thing where they're hiding their God is in the Big Bang. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are a lot of hypothe hypotheses, 
you know the brain theory the the uh, higher dimensional universes and the multiverse and everything and uh, most of them we can say that those are hypotheses that they don't have uh, you know evidence but they are mathematically plausible they are possible mm -hmm. so but the religion religious people present their god as a sure shot uh, you know uh, evidence that universe was created by god they think god is the reason for the creation of universe uh -huh. but do you even regard god as an as a hypothesis for the creation of the universe so you wouldn't even give no god no no that, no i don't that. yeah look i i i, I um I generally stopped calling myself an atheist a long time ago. I call myself an apatheist because I, a God doesn't enter into my thinking at all. And the point is, the God hypothesis is not is not a hypothesis in science. I've been a scientist for for forty years at least. I've never heard the word mentioned once in any scientific conversation because it doesn't explain anything. And there's no there's no and you don't need it. As 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 a French famous French mathematician once said, I think to Napoleon. Um, we cannot even consider it as a hypothesis even well i don't even know i don't I, well you look sure I, well i mean you can make a hypothesis that there's an intelligent creator and then you can ask to test it and then you can say there's no evidence for that hypothesis moreover it brings about lots of paradoxes so many things that 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 we th we tend to say that that we throw it out just like uh, i could make the hypothesis that there's that there are unicorns on the moon but but uh, that's a hypothesis but I can very quickly argue that that's kind of nonsense, and I think it does not. It doesn't a. It doesn't explain anything, and b. There's lots of counter evidence, and that's the way it is with the universe. That you can you can say that God created the Big Bang, and you can say, okay, so what? Uh, what evidence is there that there that in any way the Big Bang required a creation? And that's why I wrote the universe for nothing. You don't need anything. Yeah. You don't need an outside force for that to happen. Moreover, if you assume it, it brings up all sorts of questions and paradoxes. That, do, that don't produce fruitful answers. And therefore, that's why science, that's why, that's why science doesn't discuss, doesn't even bring up God, just like it doesn't bring up unicorns. So okay. any of these Sorry, scientific hypotheses it. that we have, those, uh, God doesn't stand a chance against any of those. This is well, the difference is, look, in science, a hypothesis is only useful if you can test it or if it makes predictions yeah. that are useful. And okay. and that and those things survive, and 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 uh, you know and so obviously the God aspect doesn't do either, and so only things that ultimately explain something and allow you to make predictions you can test uh, eventually in the long run survive in science. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you, Alec. Thank you very much. And la oh, last question. You. Last question from you. Uh, his answer. Oppenheim is quote from Bhagavad Gita. Now I am deaf when he looked at the nuclear bomb and said, yeah, Now that's been used by radical Hindus in India to butters, butters claims that our religion is the best. Similar thing with every other religious yeah. uh, group. Do, do physicists think there is some science in Hinduism? Well, first of all, A, I'm not exp expert in Hinduism. And B, my answer to the, to the previous question is the same. Hinduism, Christianity... Islam are never discussed in science because they don't have any impact on science. So, uh, you know, as I've been my whole, most of my life a scientist, and I never hear anyone in any scientific conference talk about these these uh, organized religions uh, in any way. And so, maybe maybe some Hindu scientists like something about the Hindu religion that they think says something useful, but it's not something they use in their work or or uh, in any way uh, it, teach in their classes it's very similar to the big bang claim in the quran but why do scientists like Oppenheimer or so many other scientists well, why do they quote the, the well it makes you feel, uh, look i quoted things from the rig veda it makes you look like you're scholarly i mean the point <laughs> is that if, you th if you think no frankly it's not so facetious all of these works are works of literature they're not sacred books but they do represent the the, the ideas of their time and therefore, as someone who's interested in, in, in the way people think, I firmly believe in reading broadly. And it's nice if you can quote, you know, there's wonderful poetry in the Bible. And there's and 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 there's undoubtedly poetry in the other sacred books, too. And so there's nothing wrong with quoting it as beautiful poetry. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much, Professor, for your time. It's been an absolute honor, and we hope to see you a bit more involved with the ex-Muslim community as well in the future. Because I'm happy to, I'm happy to be involved and happy to 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 be in you know to to move in that direction. Because there is a huge market 
for your thoughts to like India, 1.5 billion people, Pakistan, through nearly 280 million people, and the Muslim world in general, who are their minds are literally exploding now. In in some way, it's a bit shameful that it's happening now, but better late than never, I guess. But thank you very much for it's great. And yeah, anything I can do to help that, and 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 uh, yeah. Anyway, you keep up the good work. As my friend Steve Weinberg has said, who's a, a Nobel Prize winning physicist and an atheist, as he would say, you're doing God's work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, on that note, bye-bye, guys. See ya. Bye-bye.